Hello, and welcome to DU's 20th Annual Diversity Summit. We are glad you could join us for this session. In the spirit of healing and peace, we acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples of the land upon which the University of Denver stands, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute tribes. A few reminders before we get started. This year, we as a, as a DU community will be exploring the interplay and intersections of the impact of 2020 through a lens of anti-racism and anti-discrimination. Together, we will examine the many ways in which our collective past informs our shared diversity, equity, and inclusion work for the future. For some, the topics covered may include triggering or emotionally challenging topics. Please feel free to exit the event and return later as necessary. We will be closely monitoring our time together and do not condone threatening or violent language. Rather, this space is meant to provide us opportunities to learn, question, and grow. We hope you will join us on this journey. Please note your camera is off and your microphone is muted. The Q&A feature is at the bottom of your screen for you to ask questions of the panelists. We will attempt to answer um, as many questions as possible. This conversation is being recorded and will be made available on Canvas and YouTube within the week of this event. Here's a quick reminder of our Zoom controls. Take a moment to locate the chat, Q&A feature, closed caption, and leave buttons at the bottom of your screen. And finally, we ask that you share your experience via social media. This year, we will be using the hashtag DU Diversity Summit throughout these seven weeks. And now I would like to introduce uh, Stevie Lee, one of our moderators this morning, to kick off the panel. Yes, thank you, Clara. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Yat -e. My name is Stevie Lee, and I am the Native American Liaison and Program Manager at the University of Denver, located in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I want to quickly welcome all of our amazing panelists and moderator, uh, Pamela Peters, Raphael Begay, and Vicki Eagle, and Dr. Angela Parker. Um, I want to just say that I am super thankful and honored to be here to listen and learn from all of our amazing artists. And also wanted to say that uh, thank you to our Native Student Alliance um, for making this happen, as well as um, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and the DU Cultural Center. And with that, I will pass it to uh, a student currently in the Native Student Alliance, Neva Murdoch. Hello, my name is Neva Murdoch. I'm a second year here at DU and the co-chair of the Native Student Alliance. I'm from the Oglala Lakota and Yurok tribes, and I will be giving the land acknowledgement. In the spirit of healing and peace, and to resist oppression and actively seek social justice, I recognize the Cheyenne, Arapaho, yeah. and Ute tribes, and all of the original indigenous peoples of the land upon which the University of Denver stands, and to honor the fact that these land acknowledgements are put in place not only to recognize the peoples whose land we are on, but to acknowledge and commit to the fact that none of us want to continue this history that we have inherited. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nira. Um, Nira is one of our student leaders in the Indigenous community at DU, and I'm so pleased she was able to offer our land acknowledgement today. So I'm a assistant professor in the history department at DU. Um, part of my research includes uh, visual analysis, the history of Native Americans and photography, and in particular, uh, thinking about uh, photography as a way to um, define and resist definition within Indigenous communities. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome our panelists today. I think it's going to be a really exciting discussion. Um, so as I read your bios, um, if you can go ahead and turn your, uh, uh, your video on. Okay, so uh, we'll start with Vicki Eagle. Vicki is Sichangu, Sichangu Lakota. Sorry, I'm bad at pronouncing other Native names. 
Um, and she's also half Japanese from Denver, Colorado. She's currently a second year PhD student at the Department of Anthropology at UCLA. Her subfields are in sociocultural anthropology and in the American Indian Studies Department. Um, she's already spent a decade photographing her life as a contemporary Native American photographer with her project called Real Life Indian, and it's rooted in a community-based approach. Her artistic style is photojournalism and portraiture, and her current work focuses on photographing Native American heavy metal bands in a genre called res metal from the Southwest Four Corners area. Her project speaks to Gen Xers, Millennial, and Gen Z Native youth and their passion for music and the arts. And you can find her work on Instagram and on her website. Um, if you're looking for her on Instagram, it's at Real Life Indian, all one word. Um, and I encourage you also to look in the chat to um, go to the site that has the work of all of the photographers that we'll be speaking with today. Um, I'd next like to introduce Pamela Peters, who's Diné, or also known as Navajo. Um, she is a multimedia documentarian and artist from the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. Pamela is from the Tachini, or the Red Running Into the Water People clan. Um, she is a multimedia artist and produces work she regards as indigenous realism that explores the lives and diversities of real American Indians. As an artist and curator, she pushes viewers to critically analyze the psychological and historical structures of Native Americans in mass media through a Native lens while expressing creative sovereignty. She lives in Los Angeles. And in addition to her website, you can find her also on Instagram at Tachini Photography. And Tachini is spelled T-A-C-H-I-I-N-I-I. -I -I. Okay, finally, I'd like to welcome Raphael Begay, who's also Diné. And um, Raphael Begay is a photographer and curator based in the capital of the Navajo Nation. Currently, he serves as a public information officer for the Navajo Nation Division of Human Resources. He earned his BFA in art studio in 2017 with a minor in arts management and an undergraduate cer certificate in museum studies from the University of New Mexico. In 2020, Rafael was named one of 12 New Mexico artists to know as he continues to exhibit, advocate, and collaborate in creative initiatives highlighting indigenous and queer art throughout the Southwest. You can also find him at his personal website and um, on Instagram at Raphael underscore Begay. So welcome, a deep welcome to all of our panelists today. I can't wait to start our conversation. Um, and I'm going to start us off with uh, an initial question. Um, we're going to have about, um, you know, probably 30 to 40 minutes of uh, pre-curated questions, and then we're going to open it up in the last half hour to questions from the audience. So as our artists are sharing and speaking, um, please think about any questions that you might want to ask them and share them in the chat. So the first question I had is that you're all engaging in this project that raises awareness about contemporary Native communities. Um, who are your influences and who do you draw inspiration from? Good morning, everyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, Pam. That's okay. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. She Ralph Yabigay Yinashe Hanath Nishle Kilha Chitni Bashishin Tabahan Dashiche Auto Ashi and Dashinelle Sahod Sane Nasha Auto Sinishi E Chishake. Hello, everyone. My name is Ralph Yabigay. Um, as uh, Angela had mentioned earlier, I'm a photographer and curator based here in the Navajo Nation. Um, 
And right now I'm working on a photographic series called A Vernacular Response. Uh, within that work, I draw inspiration from my home where I'm originally from, which is Hunters Point, Arizona. Uh, there I grew up surrounded by my community, by my family, and, and this entity of support, of inspiration and curiosity. Um, in line of that, the work continues to move forward with this place I call home and mine, but in that um, honoring my ancestors as well as my grandparents who had a resounding effect and an influence throughout not only my life, but the lives of my family and loved ones around the community. Um, but in that, again, home is a major inspiration for myself um, and it continues to be the thing that revitalizes me on my journey. And as I explore different um, ideas within my work, uh, primarily the reservation here in the Navajo Nation, um, that is my main source of inspiration, my main source of uh, beauty and power and outlook. And I'm happy to share that here with you all um, and feel free to check out the website uh, to look at some of my work and where those inspirations are visualized. Thank you. Okay. Yat Ayesha Pamela Peterson Shne Tkachik Nishlo Ashti Bashis Chin. Uh Trohadlini Dashiche Ado Kitlishini Dashanalik with Agonizahishle. Um as an introduction, um Pamela Peters. I um I would say my biggest influence. Um, there's a lot of people that influence um, the work that I'm doing. I'm, I'm not on the reservation. I'm in an urban establishment, but I was born and raised on a reservation. Um, and, 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 you know, I graduated from Shiprock High School. So my life has always been on the reservation as a youth. And so um, I've seen the impact that has happened to me as a youth and then transitioning to an urban establishment and seeing how my identity was completely erased or um, morphed into this um, this Western ideology of what an Indian is. And so I, from that, I really feel like my, my biggest influence is change. And I want to change the perception of how people in society see us as Native Americans. And I see also the lack of positive contemporary representation of us as Indian people. And because of what I've experienced, what my family has experienced, I've used all of that into the body of work that I do with my photography. For example, um, I have relatives that were playing Indians in Western films right back in the John Ford era. Um, and I see how that has manifested into the Southwest and how it's been commodified, this whole, idea of what an Indian is supposed to be. And because of that, I really want to show who we really are today. And I show the beauty and the essence of the positive aspect of who we are as um, the diversity of who we are as Native Americans today. And my first project that I started was about the Indian relocation. And I didn't really understand how that has not really been shared or shown in society. And especially with a lot of the youth here in Los Angeles, they really didn't understand how they came to Los Angeles. And I would bring up the story about relocation. I said, you know, you probably came out here, you're like second, third generation of relocated Indians. They really didn't understand that. So I had to give them a visual story, a visual narrative. And I feel that as I started learning more about photography and about storytelling and studying other native photographers, I feel like some of my influences has been um, Horace Pota. And he was a Kiowa photographer that took photos within his community. And I feel like his work has really like influenced what I'm trying to do. And um, there's also, there's Jenny Ross, who was a phot uh, Cherokee photographer who did photography within her community. And then one of my biggest influence is Zig Jackson um, because he lived in San Francisco and he did do these amazing photography about Indian identity, but he kind of also did it with um, kind of like a stick with like a stereotype in it, which I liked, 
but you have to really go deep into understanding what his photography work is. And I think initially people just think, oh, well, that's what an Indian is, but he's talking about, no, this is what people think an Indian is. And this is the only way I can be identified within an urban community. And understanding that I really feel like that is what I'm trying to do with the body of work that I'm doing with the relocation, the real Indians retake Hollywood, you know, I, uh, other well-known non-native photographers that influenced me is George Hurl. He did, he took all these Hollywood classic um, portraits and I did that with a twist and added contemporary native actors into um, my photography work and Annie Lebow Lebowitz and she also does this really creative outlet of like um, portraits. And one person that has really, really like influenced me and is actually influencing me <laughs> deeply right now. She's a Persian photographer. Um, um, God, I'm gonna get her name wrong. Sh Sharon Nashat, is that right? Okay. Sharon. Sharon, Sharon, yeah. Um, I went to her photo exhibit um, that they had at the Broad before the pandemic. And I knew of her work, but I didn't really know like th the narratives behind it. And I literally spent two days at the museum, um, seeing all her films. I, I saw all her portraits. And right now I see what she's doing and it's really influencing me and encouraging me to be more creative in the storytelling and the story narrative. And so there's a lot of people that influence me. So those are a few people I wanna add, you know, native photographers that I've studied and then also, you know, from other cultures, other photographers. So I think everybody influences someone. And it's weird because when I have young kids that tell me that they're like, oh my God, you influenced me to do this. I love the work that you're doing. It's just kind of weird, but I get it now. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Pam. Sorry. Um, yeah, so um, everyone, my name is Vicki Eagle. Um, I am Sichangu Lakota. I actually am a University of Denver alumni. So I guess I graduated in 2012. I always have to think about calculating <laughs> in my head how long ago that was. Um, yeah, just to give you a background while I'm here, I'm back on this campus uh, virtually again. Um, and also I'm actually currently in Denver right now um, just with the pandemic and doing Zoom University like many of you all are. So thank you for you know actually joining another Zoom webinar. I know how these things go. Um, so yeah. Um, so when I was at the University of Denver, this is actually where I started my photography project, Real Life Indian. And it was because of the lack of diversity and at the time of being um, one out of maybe six Native American students on campus, there was no representation of us anywhere on campus. There, this was before the John Evans report. This was before the Native American Inclusivity Task Force. This was before... Um, people didn't even know what Sand Creek was. Like, that's how long ago I'm talking about. And um, being on a campus, right, where we are the University of Denver pioneer, I was really frustrated um, as a student. And I really needed this outlet to feel like I could represent myself and represent, um, yeah, the community are very small at the time, Native Student Alliance with like four or five members um, to feel like we are included in this university. And um, I'm not, yeah, and I definitely give big kudos to Roddy, um, the photography teacher. If anyone ever has Roddy McInnes or you can ever take a class with him, I highly encourage you because he will work with you and find your best passions and really bring out the best in you. And I feel like that's a big person I have to definitely think while I'm here on campus is Roddy. Um, Roddy brought the light to the university for me, brought um, photography as finding the light. And then that also helped me find the light within myself at the university. So I definitely wanna first thank my photography teacher from the very beginning is Roddy. Um, and then second, right, um, <laughs> I also draw inspiration from these experiences, right, from being in these, um, 
enclosed spaces at DU in predominantly white spaces that I wanted to really push this idea of what it means to be us, right? And to have this experience of your University of Denver experience will not be the same as my University of Denver experience. And that's really how I started Real Life Indian was taking pictures of my five friends right at DU and trying to find a way to show like, okay, we're here and we're also part of this university. And from there, that's, you know, I really started looking at other native photographers like Zig Jackson, Nadia Kwandabins at the time, the 2011-2010 era, um, when Concrete Indians was coming out, when I look at Zig Jackson's work and and um, just seeing, I think, like how to push this idea of how to use images to tell our story. And I think I was very inspired by that. And um, another reason, too, with these two panelists that are here today, I also ask them to come because they inspire the work I'm currently doing. You know, Pam is also always encouraging me that, um, yeah, to continue my, you know, heavy metal journey. She also even traveled with me down to the Southwest, right? And then we're also attending these shows at the same time. And yeah, just inspire me that if you have a story and you have something you want to share to keep going. And from Raphael in particular, I was very inspired by the way you do photos and textures and looking at landscape and textures and trying to think about how to look at my work beyond people because I love taking portraiture. Um, but to understand that there's also a texture to the land and inspiration coming from these places and how that influences the work, the music, the art and people's lived realities. And so, yeah, that's kind of how I ended up asking um, these two to join me on this photo panel is because they also inspire the work that I do. Um, and that they inspire me because they do work that's very different from what we're seeing um, currently right now. And um, in particular for someone from Zig Jackson too, you know, he always says in his interview, you know, why can't I be my own Indian and I'm here occupying these different areas. So when I think about what it means to be in these different areas and these conversations, I really feel like he's really asking us as, you know, native photographers is how do we even have this idea, have these conversations and how we can all express these ideas differently. So that was a big thing and other native photographers, I think I really took from, you know, come from the communities back at home where I worked at, at Red Cloud on Pine Ridge. And this was after the Aaron Huey um, era of what I call his photography and National Geographic. Um, we can talk about Aaron Huey on a different day, but <laughs> when I was working at Red Cloud at the time, you know, I was like, wow, this is very much telling a one sided story. And I was always like, so fascinated how many locals were photographers in the area and photographs like I admired are Willie White, Angel White Eyes, Juliana Brown Eyes, Tara Weston are people who are in the local community living every day um, and growing up there and they were not the ones that were telling this story for National Geographic or NPR and that really bothered me but I really like took a lot of inspiration that they were community-based photographers and that they were you know, authentically living this life and being authentic to the work that they do and what these representations mean when they put it out there. And I decided from watching them that this was something I would do for the urban Denver community. So I came back here um, when I did my master's at DU and really just like said, I wanna be a community-based photographer who photographs for the Denver Indian community. So at that time, I have a lot of pictures from um, and I'll talk about this later about like different protests, rallies, Four Direction March, um, the University of Denver students I've photographed for years. So um, that's really like how I kind of came into my practice. I'm seeing just a deep engagement with place, whether that place is an urban setting or a reservation setting or even both um, in all of your work. And that sort of leads me to ask the next question, which is um, so much of your projects and, um, you know, sort of your portrayals of Native America are deeply rooted in community, right? Um, so you're drawing a lot of inspiration from your own experiences, from the experiences of your family, potentially from, you know, Native histories, right, in the places that you're at. Um, but who do you consider to be your audience? Um, and why is it important to reach that audience? Um, have you had any surprises in terms of 
um, who constitutes your audience and who you've been able to um, reach in your work. If you guys could talk a little bit on that, I'm, I'd love to hear it. I could start off. Um, I think uh, this is something I definitely consider when I am sharing and communicating my work, uh, more particularly the stories that I share with the images. Um, as a photographer, I feel that we have a inherent responsibility and depth to the images that we take, that we shoot, that we document. Um, and moving forward in terms of reciprocity um, and with respect to what I take from the land, the knowledge that I acquire, how do I act as a steward, as an artist to those particular beliefs, outlooks, perspectives, and moments. Um, so with that in mind, knowing that my work stems directly from the reservation, reservation-based life, different parts of the reservation, um, I would like to think that that is my primary audience. However, I continue to find myself uh, sharing uh, space, you know, respectfully saying, um, in places that are outside the reservation. And one thing that I like to consider within my work is this internal versus external perspective when speaking, understanding, engaging with the work. Um, obviously, with uh, Pamela, I could probably have some few inside jokes or understandings regarding particular images that we were to share or discuss. Um, but moving forward, it's important to me to develop an audience, not necessarily as an external part of the work, but look at it as a component of it and rather community, not audience. Uh, therefore, I am representing my community. I am acting on behalf of my community. I am being, I am a steward to my community where um, my community, for example, within the reservation are very land-based and tied to the land and those understandings. Uh, how can I replicate that within my work and explore those ideas, um, taking that back to indigenous aesthetics, aesthetics indigenous to land, people, and to the aesthetics itself. Um, within this journey of being able to share through activation of images through storytelling, I had an opportunity to present at Indian Market, which was sort of like my first run at presenting my work to an external audience. And I, um, I wasn't expecting, um, that was my first experience with Indian Market. I have a interesting, I have a, a different relationship with it. But while I was there and prepping for the event, uh, I had um, Will Wilson, who was on the panel with me, who's been a large inspiration in my life. And we were there getting ready to present with Dr. Donette of UNM, as well as uh, Deva Romanek, who's the curator of the Maxwell. And lo and behold, there was James Ferris sitting in the front seat, who's the author of Navajo Photography, um, a book that I've learned and have in my possession. And um, Will just nonchalantly introduced me, oh, this is James. And I was like, oh, great. Hi, James. Nice to meet you. And just went totally over my head. And Will saw that. And, you know, he, as a good relative, reached back out to me like, that's James Ferris, the author of this particular book. Not sure if you heard about it. And at that point, there went my confidence uh, <laughs> for the presentation. But I think those interactions, those types of exchanges, those experiences, not necessarily just between people, but our experiences and our relationships to our surroundings, not necessarily just the land, those that create. Um, and that that comes from the sky, the light. Uh, these, are, these are gifts, these are blessings. We should respect it in that way. So as I continue to share these stories, I hope to, again, develop a community where I can share and exchange and learn and grow. But now is the challenge being based here in the reservation to bring that back and centralize it here on the reservation and see how I can collaborate so that's one of my goals this year is to not necessarily go out, but come in within my work. Thank you. I guess I can go. I think we've created a, a level of like who starts and who's gonna go after that. So um, who do you consider my audience? I actually, I'm not sure. Um, I, I would say just open mind minded people that um, look beyond a photo and see beyond the context of what they're visually seeing, but look also at the embedded historical narratives that I'm putting in there. 
um, open-minded people that really understand that. I think it's important because they're the ones that can write and share that historical narrative um, behind the images and give us a dignified voice. And I'm fortunate enough where there's people that really like understand that layer of my photography as opposed to just seeing a portrait. Um, it was very hard for me to share my portraits in the native community because they couldn't understand it. And it was kind of sad because they're like, well, how come you can't put a feather in them so they know that we're natives? And I'm like, well, that's the reason why <laughs> I'm doing the photo photography work that I'm doing is because I don't want to follow that, that, that layer of what society believes we are. We don't have to have these these objects of Indianness to be known as an Indian. And I do these, um, these narratives, like, like, like for instance, when I did Legacy of Exile Indians, um, I didn't think a lot of people would understand it. Um, I was very surprised at the attention I got from it. Um, I actually just, did it as a homage to just say, I like this film. When I saw the the um, when I saw the exiles, and I also loved seeing these old photos of my parents, and I never see that in any platform in society. So, I want to show these images that our reality of who we are during, especially at the peak of Hollywood films. And I can go in deeply in, into that and it takes forever for me to talk about, but um, I just really wanted to change what I was seeing in Western films as and, and, and counter, counter it with exactly what was happening during that time. 50s and 60s, we were going through relocation. We had these policies um, that was happening to Indian communities. And so that series is really, it, it's, it's impact with so many different issues. It's, it's impact with the history, Indian policies, appropriations, claiming images, and most importantly, it's giving us dignified voices. And from that, I want my audience to see that. And it, it has expanded where I've done lecture series about that project where I talk about all of this, I can, you know, pack it up, you know, unpack it and, and tell students, you know, this is the reason why I did this project. It gives us a dignified voice. It tells us about the policies. It tells us about relocation. It tells us about what was happening. Whereas in Hollywood films, they were telling you that, you know, having this glitz and glamour lifestyle was what we were, we're supposed to have. So it, 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 it goes into different steers of, of, of storytelling. And I'm really surprised at how um, a lot of scholars and a lot of um, journalists really picked up on that, on, on, the, on the narrative behind the image. Um, I, I feel it's important right now for us as Native people to tell stories. Um, um, I think my, 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 my vision of my storytelling has shifted a little. It's got, I mean, I'm going to talk to Raphael a little bit about this because I'm going back home and one of my projects I'm working on is about my homeland. And I think it's important, especially because of the pandemic, we're losing our elders. I lost my father um, about a month ago. And I've just seen so much change happening. You know, I'm a, I'm a 70s kid. And so seeing the vibrant land from the 70s to where it is now, it's really sad, it's heartbreaking. So I wanna share that because I'm doing that as a personal narrative for my, my family, for my grandkids. So they understand and saying, this is how, this is what your grandparents, this is what your great, great grandparents did for the land so we could, you know, live. And it's, this is where it is now, but I want, I don't want you to forget it, even though the land base is disappearing. I don't want you to forget it. So it's, it's shifted. 
And so my audience um, is shifted a little. It's become more personal now. So thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, Pam, for that. I really appreciate that because um, I think the different projects and how we approach different um, projects that we do it becomes a different audience each time. So it's not like this one continuous, like it is for the, this exact reason. And um, I actually really believe photography does become really personal. Um, if you're your first audience always starts with you and then I always think from there right you kind of reflect like who is going to look at it from there right and I think the question of audience has always also been challenging for me as well. I think you know when I started as a community based photographer just taking pictures of events that were happening in Denver I didn't think at that moment, 10 years later, I'm going to look at these photos and have a different reaction to it. And um, I'm mainly in particular thinking about, um, so in 2011, when I really started this work, I would go to the Columbus Day protests um, that were also done by Colorado AIM um, from the Four Directions March folks, I don't know more, the Sand Creek Healing Run. Um, and all these things that really took place here in Denver that were very particular here. So what most people don't know, right, Columbus Day actually started in Denver. So as AIM, Colorado AIM, going to these protests, right, and then being there annually, no matter how cold it was in October or if it was a nice day, um, we were there, right? And I think about the photos I took then because I have a lot of, in a way, <laughs> people were upset, right, that we were there as AIM um, protesting Columbus Day. And seeing the pictures from like the police that are there, the um, reactions from the people, even people flipping off native people for being there on Columbus Day. And then I think about like, at that time I was like, oh, I'm just here to document this and to put this as like an archive of what I've seen happen. And now that we actually don't have Columbus Day um, with Indigenous Peoples Day and how much I think our society from then until now has really changed. Cause even at the University of Denver, us having a little table for indigenous people's day was extremely controversial. And the teepee that was brought, that's kind of this annual tradition. Now we were the first NSA group to bring it on campus to make this point. And I think about like those, that era, right? And I think about how as this community-based photographer looking at all the things happening in Denver, I have years of the Sand Creek Healing Run and seeing those, those youth, I can say youth now as adults who are now leading this, right? And I think that that's just like part of, um, I guess where I stem my first audience is like, it's really for us as like native people, right? To really look back, look at all these things happening and then to be able to tell the story through, right? And then other projects that I'm doing, such as my real life Indian project, you know, when I was first starting that, um, I actually got a lot of backlash and emails on the word choice of Indian. And some people were like, oh, well, Indian's offensive and we're not India, we're not from India, et cetera, right? And I completely understand that. And the reason I actually purposely did that was because I wanted to really talk about the history, right, of the word Indian, right, and where that comes from and to talk about like from a historical perspective, we're looking at all treaties are signed to Indians, right? So we're looking at Indian Termination Act, Indian Relocation Act, Indian Boarding Schools, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Indian Removal Act. So what story, right, for me when I was picking real life Indian is who are these Indians, right? And then who are these like Indians named after? Why are all these policies, right, are named after Indian, right? So, um, yeah, and then um, because of that, I, I came up with this name to call this real life Indian of like, okay, all these things have happened to us as native peoples, Indian peoples, and what does it look like now for us in this era? And after I explain it to people, I think then they start really understanding why I'm doing that and to say like, why is it you don't know the tribal nations of where you're at, right? So if you don't know, if you go to a different state, a lot of people can't name the historical tribes of the areas easily. Um, for the most part. And I've done the presentations across Colorado at the time where people also didn't know the Cheyenne Arapaho Ute. And yeah, I just saw like, again, this like constant invisibility and even this um, history, the lack of hist understanding of history, right? Because of this curriculum. So when I did the portraiture, right? So a lot of my portrait projects, um, such the ones I did with NSA and about how they felt about the pioneer name, 
I actually only did portraiture without any background. So I didn't want to attach any land association in that sense, like how Curtis would stage his photographs or how other native photographers were putting like people behind nature or people behind these backgrounds. I said, what would it look like if I made a project where we just position people behind a white background and they had no other choice but to look at native people and how they looked, how they're presenting themselves, how they're being photographed. Um, how they're put like all these things and like the different how many different looks right that we all have and how diverse our communities are so that's why I kind of moved it to this white background um, was to kind of like take out all the noise and all of the things people their conceptions or how they're indexing right in their minds like what a native would look like so that's kind of like how I think my audience originally started out with and then as I moved on to res metal to look at heavy metal bands. I think honestly this one, and I really appreciate Pam for talking about being your inner audience is kind of going back to who you were. And I had to think about myself as this, what was it that I loved the most, right? As a, as a high schooler, right? And I thought about, yeah, why aren't we talking about Indians who freaking love metal and like who love these concerts? And I was like, that should be out there. And that can really disrupt, I think our entire notions of what people think we should be. So, and I just thought about myself growing up, how concerts and music and especially like metal and rock has really helped me navigate my emotions growing up in the cities and not being represented. And what would it have been like if I had known, right? How many, there were like 200 metal bands, right? In the Southwest in the early 2000s, right? Like that would have totally changed who I was as a person knowing that, right? Then feeling like this like sad, I always say sad emo kid um, <laughs> in general in the city. So yeah, so I think that like, it's just like telling that story, seeing, and then seeing who really jumps with that and, and relates to that. So sorry, that was a long answer, but that's what I got. <laughs> no, thank you so much. And I just really appreciate um, sort of the willingness to think through these topics and these inspirations and these people that were um, that you're trying to reach, um, and and recognizing that uh, it's not um, what's the word? It's not sort of like in this constant referent with like Euro America, right? That there is like an internal definition and an internal dialogue with your community or with other native people that you know many times takes precedence in the work that you're producing so i i really appreciate the answers and i was just wondering if any of you would be willing to just come and teach my class <laughs> it's only 12 weeks <laughs> i'd love my students to hear you guys talk <laughs> on many of these topics week after week um but my last question, and I think Pam um, sort of referenced this when she's talking about, um, I want my grandkids, right, to know what this place was like, you know, this place that is home. Um, and I want them to recognize that this was something, you know, beautiful and meaningful, even in the midst of all of this change that's sort of associated with settler colonialism. Um, but how do you envision the work that you're doing um, working towards a better future for Native people, um, and what's the long your long term goal for the your work? So with the established order, <laughs> I'll go ahead and go. Um, but I think a, the the end goal that I'm trying to accomplish, or not necessarily accomplish, but activate. I believe in activating space. I believe in activating conversations, thought, process. Um, with that in mind, I believe very much in visual sovereignty. Uh, we as storytellers and stewards of the earth, of this land of, of you know, pre-colonial times and the knowledge that's been passed down to us, I believe it's our responsibility to preserve it. I believe it's our responsibility to own it, uh, to celebrate it, to challenge it. And that's what we as artists do um, within our own respects. Uh, I believe in visual creative self-determination and uh, not necessarily limited by our identities that change constantly, uh, just like projects, our audience changes um, as our audience changes, although ourselves would change with respect to that relationship. 
Um, but in that, I, I think of my work um, portraits of as portraits of the land and not necessarily portraits of people, um, but of thoughts of creativity, of indigenous imagination, of perseverance in terms of creating a makeshift corral uh, to house your lifestyle and to uh, you know, support yourselves, your, your, your surroundings and those who you call your relatives, in this case, the Beth, the sheep. Um, and I hope that my work in the same way that I choose to activate space and time that I can, the work itself can activate memory, can activate joy, emotion, thought, um, when being viewed, uh, when shared. And that, that is my hope in terms of uh, us defining ourselves and empowering those around us and not necessarily me telling a story, but uh, sharing this space with those who are willing to share that, share this narrative. Um, well, what I, I mean, first of all, I do want my family, like, like Vicki was saying, your audience does tend to change. Um, my inspiration tends to change, um, with the body of work that I'm doing. And I love that. I love the, the openness of being creative with, with visual photography. Um, but most importantly, what I'm doing with my portraits is I really want to give us a dignified voice, a dignified image. Um, I want society to see us and understand the narrative behind the portraits that I'm taking. I'm very particular on people I take portraits of. I want positive representation. I want our youth to see my portraits and see themselves. Um, I. I have to say that I really like taking portraits of people that are from reservations that understand their community and then putting them in this context of like the beauty of, of who they are, the essence of, of, their, of, of, of their soul in my portraits because I don't want our youth to see continually thinking that they have to play into society's idea of what an Indian is. I want them to just see themselves. And that's the reason why I'm saying I'm very particular of people that I take portraits of. I want them to see them in a positive, I want, I want positive representation because I remember how I was as a kid on the reservation and not seeing myself in any film and television. And I remember even like when we were, when, when I lived with my grandparents, we had a lot of people, because we, we would sell fruits and vegetables on the side of the road um, to buy our school clothes. And they, there's a mountain um, that would go over to Chin Lee. And so we had a lot of tourists that would stop and buy you know, fruits and always say, oh, look at the cute Indian kids. And they would always want to take photos of us. And thank God for my, my rebellious cousin, Terry, he would tell them no, unless they paid us. <laughs> and he, would, he was very honest. And I still remember that conversation where he's like, well, what are you going to put us in some like postcard in like China? And that's probably what they did. And so how how when, when you do that to people how are you engaging in in photos when i do my work i know the people i'm taking photos of i want to get to know them it's an interaction i noticed when i was a photography assistant for a well-known photographer it was a task they didn't want you to get to know the people we were working with it was just a task in a in a job and i thought is this really what I want to do? Is this what I want to do to earn my income? I want to actually do things that have meaning behind it. And that's the contribution I want to do for our community is to have meaning behind the images that I'm taking. And again, it's about representation. It's about the historical um, history of who we are as Indian people, that's important. And we can do it in so many different faucets. And 
I just happened to do it in photography. So thank you. It kind of reminds me of this essay by Raina Green, and she's writing about Frank Matsura, um, who took a number of images in sort of Eastern Washington state. And um, she writes about one photograph in particular, and she said, in this photograph, Indians aren't weird, heartbroken exiles. They're in their contemporary time, they're changed, but they're in control. And um, so a lot of what you're saying um, in your last response just sort of reminded me really clearly of that essay. And I wanted to flag that for my students because I did assign that essay to them. <laughs> All right, Vicki. <laughs> See, I'm helping you and you don't even know it. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you again, everyone. I really love everyone's responses and it's really amazing. I think right now to just like talk, go through all these things and how we approach these questions too and how we're interpreting it is really, really great too. So yeah, I guess for my work, um, for contributing better to for the communities and my long-term goals, like I'm still trying to figure out my long-term goals. That's, I feel like as a photographer, it's something you're always trying to figure out and you're always have new ideas. And sometimes you have too many ideas. So then you're working on, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I get distracted with other projects and other projects come up or new ideas come up and there's only one of me and there's a lot going on all the time. <laughs> um, but right now, I think for me, like my main focus is really on looking at res metal and looking at forms of indigenous sonic resistance and finding ways to talk about how the sounds and expressions and sonic sounds and waves are creating, I think, this how are we communicating back, right? So to these like lived experiences and then how do I photograph that? And so I'm trying to find ways, right? And it's what's hard and there are limitations to photography, right? So I think about like Suzanne Sondage and her long thing about why she hates photographs. And I kind of, I, I understand where she gets sometimes because I'm like, man, with my photograph, there's no sound in this. And you have to understand the sound sometimes to understand this photo and that's where, I really like multimedia and mixing and trying to incorporate sounds and video and movement and everything together. But in terms of like the photography part of it, like I really hope that I guess the photos that I'm taking within Res Metal or within, you know, with my University of Denver students when we're doing our portraitures or we're talking about the pioneer, I just really hope that you know, with our photos, we're able to tell the story we want to express. And I also think it's always having to go back to um, giving the photo to our, you know, I always ask for permission to use this photograph. Can I use this one? I'm always asking all the time. Um, and this constant like, yeah, reflexivity to it. But I also hope that with the photographs I take is that we don't have to constantly display this authenticity or this authentic culture. And something that I'm just seeing a lot in multimedia marketing is multimedia in general is just having to wear our culture to be native a lot. <laughs> and um, I just hope like through Red's Metal and that's something you can see in my pictures, you'll see um, like three women suspended behind a scenery right of the Sandias because they're a heavy metal band in Albuquerque. And I'm just hoping that having them in their button jackets and right and then just in this amount of denim and the, the, with these guitars that it's able to really, um, I hope like make things more complicated for people to understand who we are. Um, and etc. So yeah, I'm hoping that my work for this, you know, really is for the Reds Metal community first, you know, and I know every time I show up, I ask for permission from the bands. A lot of them want the pictures I take. They're not often used to photographers, right, with like really big cameras, right, coming at them being like, can I take your photographs and this and they're like, sure, that's fine. But then I hope that all the images that I take, it's really to show this positive thing that shows that we're expressive, emotional, um, and we and a message right within these images, right, and that you don't have to have this performance of Indianness all the time, and that we can share this story within ourselves. So I hope that's what I can contribute and, you know, try to find ways to bring that to light. This um, relates to one of the questions that popped up in the Q&A. So we're going to go ahead and transition over to 
questions that the audience might have. And I have a few follow-up questions I'd like to ask in case our audience um, is not you know, posing a ton of questions. Um, so one person wanted to know, what is the reaction each of you would want from your audience when they see your work? Go ahead, Pam. I don't, I, I don't think, I think with anything, I want them to really ask why I did the portraits that I do. I, I think I get excited when people are like, well, I don't, I don't get it. And I'm like, oh, well, let me explain it to you. I get excited about that because um, like I said, there's, there's a narrative behind my portraits and um, uh, it's, I love it. I love it when people are like, I don't get it. Um, and I think a lot of, I think I get more excited when I hear native youth, when they see my portraits, they're like, I, I don't get it. Why did you take a photo of her dressed up and beautiful and glamorous? And then I, ha I explain it and then they're like, oh, okay. And they're like, yeah, that's right. I have never seen a Native American actor in that setting. That's pretty cool. And then when I say, okay, well, this person's from a reservation, they're like, oh yeah. So it opens up their mind and their ability to ask more and more questions, um, which, I, which I really like. Um, I just actually wanted to add on to something Vicki said with the sound. I do add sound to a lot of my my portraits, my, my, my um, narratives and my um, series that I do. I do, um, I do interviews with the people that I take um, portraits of. I've done short films. Um, I just completed one uh, about a month ago that I'm doing about Indian Alley, which is a, um, a place in downtown Los Angeles. I'm bringing some history to our placement of who we are as native people in an urban setting. And so that's kind of been my focus. That's how, what really drew me to start my work is to really give like a place of who we are as natives and why we're in the city and what brought us to the city. And so I'm doing that with the body of work that I'm doing. Um, it's branched out to different layers. It's branched out to um, Legacy of Exile Indians, which talks about relocation and talks about placement, um, real Indians retake Hollywood. Um, and then it's also about represent representing your tribal nation. And so I've had, I've done a portrait series where I've had people show their uh, tribal flags in different places in the city. Um, it's, it's, there's just a, there's so many different ideas. I, I think I have to agree with Vicki that there's so many ideas that sometimes you get like, ah, you get overwhelmed and you're not sure where you want to focus. And sometimes I do tend to do that. I, I get, I also um, have ADD a little. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I love when people don't get it and I want to explain is really what I'm trying to say. Um, <clears throat> I alluded to this earlier, but um, I would like the person receiving the experience to be activated, uh, for their senses to be jolted a little bit, but also for them to understand that the series itself of vernacular response is the everyday life of those who live on the reservation. Um, and I pride myself in documenting uh, visual blessings is what I refer to them or moments uh, from my life and from my, as I uh, go about my day and within these spaces and to remind them that we as artists, as uh, photographers, as visual storytellers attribute value uh, to what we see within the world. And we hold that value when we share uh, that experience. And I would just hope that uh, those who are viewing my work understand that there is value in what you are seeing, whether it is a res dog with a, a sheep head, uh, a dilapidated uh, roof of a hogan, but the way it aligns with the geometry and placement within the frame of the land and how it references pipe dreams in terms of imagining the everyday as something as fantasy. 
um, and I hope to empower uh, fellow Diné photographers and artists and, and indigenous creators that their everyday lives and what's in front of them is a blessing and it's a gift and it's up to them to utilize it uh, to uh, communicate with the world, but to also understand the world as well. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that point, um, Raf, especially for what I want to do, right, with Real Life Indian is this every day, what people think is mundane, but to understand that this is every day for us um, is part of that narrative and part of that experience as well. Um, so yeah, I know I've had people think my portraits are pretty much studio portraits, right? And they're like, oh, it's really basic. You just have them with a white background. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly the reason that you're upset. It's a white background is why it's a white background, right? So I hope that people, I think, like at least think about like why is it right that if it's just an Indian by themselves right why are they having this reaction to that um, that's part of I think part of the work that I want to do but I think um, for me if, as, if anyone's viewing any photographic work I hope that there's this reflective responsibility that once you do learn something with this knowledge that you carry that with you and that you um, you know whether you learn something new or you learn something um, that you haven't thought about before that you would share that with someone else or that you're also um, you know, letting people know that they're different, uh, different forms of expressions of work and art. So I, I think it's that and also to learn more about Native people. So that's what really I hope that people like walk away with is this more curiosity for that. Thank you so much for all of those answers. I think there's a lot to just sort of think through and to, to take with us past the end of this panel. Um, I have one question in the Q&A um, that uh, is very concrete and specific. So can anyone remember a photo from your childhood that captivated you or moved you so much that it has inspired your um, artistic trajectory? Uh, I would love to share this. Um... Uh, there's a photograph on the website uh, that Vicky is hosting with our work. Thank you for that. Uh, it's called My Backyard. I took that photograph in 2016. Um, this was at the height of the media coverage of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and at the time, my uh, um, instructor, Adrian Salinger at UNM, um, offered this question to me as to why I was reluctant to represent my people at a time when self-determination and vitality was necessary. And I, I, I know it's a huge responsibility, but at the time I didn't want to take it on. And so I returned home at this time of these questions and I came back uh, to this particular place, which is in where I grew up in our backyard and the water is running. And it reminded me of this, the first photograph I took that I looked at as art. Um, it was in sixth grade, uh, it was at the Seattle Medical Center in Fort, uh, I'm sorry, middle school um, in Fort Defiance, Arizona, where Jill Farkas was the photography instructor. She hosted the yearbook, she did painting, she did, new, you know, she did it all. Uh, so I remember she told us we were gonna have a mini group exhibition in the gymnasium. And I thought, well, I wanna go out and find a photograph that's worth sharing. I didn't wanna just do my, what was around me. I guess at the time I didn't find value in it, but I returned to this place and it was raining. And I just remember the water gushing and me being smaller and having a more limited perspective. I took a photograph of just the water gushing over this, this rock formation here that you see on the screen. And lo and behold, when I returned there so many years later, that's where I began. And that's when I really decided to put those two together and use it as a foundation for my career and what I hope to accomplish. Thank you. Ah, you're showing my photos, yay. <laughs> um, there is a photo that, that doesn't exist anymore, um, unfortunately. It probably, I hope we can find it somewhere. But when I was a child, I, my parents took a lot of photos when they were um, younger, which I loved, love seeing. And there was this one particular portrait that I just loved. And I still envision it, right? When you said that, I was like, oh my God, I know which one it is. 
So it was my parents, they were probably like in their early 20s. And my mom had like capri pants on, she had a nice cardigan, cardigan sweater, and my dad's holding her hand, and they're next to the Hogan. And there's these beautiful clouds in the background. And I thought of like Navajo American Gothic, very Grant Wood kind of an image. And I remember that photo, I just thought it was the most beautiful portrait I've ever seen. And my mom was, you know, smiling, my dad's smiling, he's holding my mom's hands, um, very elegant, and just seeing the whole structure of the, the land of where my grandparents lived and the Hogan they lived in, which doesn't exist anymore, and seeing the beautiful trees of the orchard behind her, and I don't know, that, that, that particular photo just kind of, um, it really like impact me because it, 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 it made me want to do something very similar, which I actually did for my nephew when my nephew um, got married about two years ago. I did their, um, I was an unofficial wedding photographer <laughs> and I did a portrait very similar to that. There was an old, old like 1950s car in the background and there was like a fork behind the truck. And I said, can you just do this portrait? And I did it when they were married and he, they had a whole old like 50 style gas can and, she, and my, my nephew had the fork and they stood in front of this truck. And when my mom saw it, she goes, that reminds me of when we were young. And so I feel like in a way I've kind of like connected two generations with, with portraits and so, I like to do, I, I like to be creative and, and going back into a particular time in, in history and recreate it and redefine it and restructure it so this generation can understand. So, yeah. Yeah, I can't necessarily think of a childhood, right? Very particular photograph. Um, but my dad was a photographer as well. So I think like just looking at his his photographs and looking at, um, you know, the AIM era movement, because my dad was really involved with AIM, especially in the South Dakota area. So looking at those photographs and looking at those, um, just the powwow time as well. So like looking at what Oglala Nation looked like in the 70s and 80s, like looking at kind of these like photographs that he took during his time and working with like Russell Means and being kind of in those areas and in those spaces like I guess for me I think that's why I, I lean towards photojournalism or photo documentary is like I really like looking at these photographs people take and looking at the era right of like what was happening during those times so sometimes I just I look at my dad's work and kind of like what he had um, back in those days and kind of look at how I could also create something that also looks like that. So um, we'll see what it looks like in the future, but at least for now, it's just like, it's fun to look at those photos. Um, so we have a more theoretical question as well. Um, one student is asking, how do you view your work in relation to time? Um, do you think of photography as preserving the present or the past or um, something else? Well, my thought photography is both the present and the past. Um, I'm hoping to, like I said earlier, is to restructure that history that time and place from the 1950s and 60s that we weren't represented. And I'm redefining it in a dignified way through the portrait series that I'm doing. And I'm also engaging it with the, the youth of this generation so they can understand and connect from that time to who we are today. Like, thank you for showing my photos um like for this you know this is real indians retake hollywood and george hurl is such an iconic photographer and i love as much as i 
I say that I don't like Western films. I, I do like Western films because it was a time that I remember as a child. So it gives me that memory. But I also like ho old classic Hollywood films. And I always see that time where I'm like, why weren't we represented? Why were we not placed in that? Why can't? Well, actually, I can do that. I can recreate and put us in there. And that's what I love about photography. And that's why I did this whole beautiful portrait series. It gives us this beauty, this, you know, creativeness of, 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 of our existence. And these are all native actors. They are from, um, you know, tribal nations and they know their community. And so I want young people youth when they see these they're like oh I didn't and they, it connects them to the history that they don't know about because they don't know who Audrey Hepburn is and then they research and they're like oh she was a well-known actress well why can't we be a well-known actress why can't we be icons during this time so um I'm doing that with my portraits and I did you know I, I, I like being creative like this. It's a lot of work, as you can see, but, you know, finding, creating the costumes and replicating them to those, to that time and place. Um, but I love it. I love doing that. Can you just show one more portrait um, of what I'm doing with the Hollywood series? Yes, sorry. Um, For some reason, my like, um, yeah, it just like froze and then it went white. Oh, and I was okay. like, whoops, hold on. Let me come back up here. <laughs> Which so, one? So um, th that one. This one? No, no, no. The next one after this. So well, actually, I could go back one more. I'm sorry. So this is part of the Legacy of Exile Indian series that I did um, that's ret retelling the story of um, Indian relocation. And I love this because there's so many layers to this portrait. It's talking about Indian policy, it's talking about history, it's talking about placement of tribal communities, it's talking about the diversity of tribes, but it's also talking about another element that I think LA historians like is that it's talking about gentrification um, because this whole background, welcome to Los Angeles Union Station, it's all gone, it's been modernized. And I was able to capture that and lock it in in some of my photography. Um, a lot of the places that I saw in the exiles, the 1956 film, I was able to go back to those locations. And unfortunately those locations are being gentrified and they're being modernized. And there's, you know, th that's another audience that I'm engaging into my photography work that I had no idea I was doing. Um, but with the Hollywood series, um, I have another tier that I'm doing where I'm taking portraits, beautiful portraits. And I am I was influenced, like I said earlier, by um, Sharon, no. Sharon Nishad. Sharon Nishad. Yeah. Because if you look at this portrait, it's a portrait of um, West Studi. But what I did is I put all the films that he has been in, in the background. So you have to really look closely at the image in order to see the, the writing behind his, his photo. And it has, and I did that because I want people to engage into this and see beyond just a portrait of a, a, a Native American actor. I want to see what's behind him and what he's carrying with him. And so I'm doing this with a lot of um, older, actors. Um, I just did a portrait with um, Tantu Cardinal. And so I'm going to be doing something like this with her. And I did that with um, Zon McLaren and David Midthunder. And so these are actors that have a body of work that they've done in Hollywood, but nobody really knows them. And so I'm showing them in this beautiful portrait image and showing the body of work that they've been doing throughout these years as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry. Maybe yeah, no, no worries. Here. So I'm connecting multi-generations 
into the body work that I'm doing. Yeah, I think for me, um, yeah, I don't know if I'd say I'm preserving um, this past necessarily as much as um, telling the story of it. I guess that's a form of preserving, but I guess I want to see it more as, um, yeah, I just, I guess, a different way of understanding of time and place. So looking at kind of like what a Native um, or Indigenous understanding of time and place and about looking at what, how time is so different um, because we look at time like very much like by the minute, by the hour, by the year, but that like a native version of time and place, right, is sometimes about memories around a certain um, genre or scene, right? So in particular for res metal, right? So even though the res metal scene was like huge in the early 2000s and it's like in this stage of dwindling, there's still this constant hope, right, that this can come back this will be back this moment in time and space will come back so i think like there's a lot of variations right of time and place and understanding that and i think it's um i just hope that my work just contributes to i guess like yeah just the continuing conversation right of what time and place means and it's like pam's childhood is not the same as my childhood and like what all these different meanings and things bring to us or um like in particular for my res metal scene, what has this scene meant to them, right? And as adults looking back on it, they said, I had a great adolescent teenage year because of this scene, right? And then how does that influence their life moving forward? And how does that influence like, you know, we were community together, we were together here at this time and that meant everything, right? And just seeing, I think, how all those things interconnect together. Um, that's kind of how I'm looking at my work is to try to show how all these things move together. Um, we had a couple of questions in the Q&A that deal with uh, sort of diversity within community. Um, so I'll read both of them out and you can choose uh, which one you would rather um, respond to. So one attendee asks, from my own experience as a Chicanx artist, I've found that my art is often considered political even if the intention isn't, even if the work doesn't address politics. Have any of you experienced this response to your work as well? Um, and I might group a third question in there. Uh, another attendee asks, you touched a bit on your use for saying Indian versus Native American, um, and what is the meaning to you in using the term Indian? And then finally, one question that I attempted to answer, but I'd love to hear um, the panelists' responses to. Um, another attendee asked, Someone mentioned queerness in their art. What is the history of queerness in the community? And so my response was there's a pretty diverse uh, sort of range of community histories of queerness. Um, I talked a little bit about the teeny bit that I know about um, gender structures uh, within Diné communities, um, but there are a multiplicity of gender structures that um, were out there previous to sort of the, the influence of boarding schools and um, you know, the imposition of this sort of bifurcated gender system. Um, so if any of you would you know, be interested in touching on that, I would love to hear answers to that question as well. So I identify as Diné first. Um, and then that leads itself to self-identification, self-determination, having that sovereignty and respect for yourself. We as individuals, as peoples, uh, although different, we are all sacred. Um, so I would just uh, respond to it in that respect. But with terms of politics, I believe that when we are creating, uh, we are creating space, we are abrupting or changing a moment that is set. Uh, we are also taking from it. And I believe as a storyteller, uh, you are also an advocate as you are advocating for a narrative, for an understanding, for a message. But as an indigenous storyteller, as an indigenous advocate, I believe um, your culture comes first uh, with that respect. And I think the majority of, of those would identify with that first. I'm wearing a Navajo Nation SEAL shirt here today. Um, but I would just want to challenge those listening and thank those who joined us today that in terms of diversity, it's all about understanding and realizing that someone has different perspective from you. And that's the beauty and joy of it all is that exchange of knowledge, of experience and of emotion. Uh, 
Um, so can we just jump on any questions? Oh, okay. Um, well, I always say I'm a political prisoner, so all my work is political. <laughs> um, it, it, it is political. Um, I think as Native Americans, all of our work is political. It's always going to be, but as sovereign nations, we, you know, use our sovereign minds to unpack that and educate. I think, I think, you know, everyone on this panel, we, I think our work is educating people most importantly. Um, I, going to the, the terms Indian versus Native American, um, just like with, with, with Vicki, I like using Indian because it's a political term. It's, a, it's part of our treaty. It, it's, it's part of how the United States has identified us. But what I've done is I've, um, I've, I use Indians as my way of um, countering that um, colonial terminology. And so it's restructuring. I, you know, that question is always asked, why do you use Indians? I said, because it's, it's, it's so similar to Indians, but we're reclaiming and re-identifying it and destroying that colonial terminology, but also giving us a new placement of who we are in society. And when I first heard that back in, I think the, um, the late nineties, I saw these, some of my, my cousins and their friends do um, graffiti and they started using it in D and Z. And I just really loved it. And I, I, I know it's been around. I didn't develop it. I want to make sure people understand it. I didn't develop it. It was developed by some creative youth on the reservation. Um, they've used it in different ways. I know they use it um, with an S and some use it with I N D, I think I, I N D, Indian. So there's different ways. And I love that, that we can reclaim and re-identify our terms. Um, but I use Indians when I talk about policies and I will always use Indian because that is the relationship we have with the United States. And we still need to teach people why we have that term. And that's why I will continue to use that term. But in my body of work, I identify as Indians to reclaim and restructure who we are. I really want to get gear away from using Native American, um, but it's hard. And now there's the new terminology of in indigenous, which I really clinch with because it gives a broader statement and we get lost in the narrative of that. And I really try to avoid using the term indigenous because indigenous means worldwide. It doesn't mean just one community, it's worldwide. It means people from Asia, from Africa, everywhere. And so I avoid that because we get lost in that context. And so I like to use Indians, I-N-D-Z. Yeah, to go off of Pam, yeah, you will find a very diverse answer, right, from anybody <laughs> um, in terms of Native American or indigenous or using the term Indian. And like I said, some people don't like that I use the term Indian, but it's really to, yeah, address this relationship, right? As I mentioned before, from all the policies, treaties, and then this idea of like, well, who are these Indians? And to remind people that these things were in place for a reason, right? So I think, um, yeah, I think for me, like the reason I use that, and then also from Colorado, I mean, how many people have seen those native bumper stickers, right? So that also is the reason why I like hate using the term Native American sometimes because native means you were the first born somewhere. That's why they have those Colorado Native, right? And Colorado Native stickers and Native stickers, right? It's to say that they were the first born there, right? But then they completely erase, right? This idea of like the original people of the Cheyenne Arapaho Ute. So that's why I try to, I sometimes don't use Native American, but when I worked in admissions, right at UCLA University of Denver, 
like I understand there are times where you're gonna find those like checker box things. And I think part of um, being a native photographer is also to say like, this is a thing that we have to go through. And these are the complexities of our relationships and our identifiers and how all these things have been placed on us. But like, have you ever asked us how we want to identify? If I tell you I'm Si Changu Lakota, like how many people would know that from the Ocheti Shakoween, right? And it'll just be like blank silent for the most part sometimes. So I think it's like really complex, right? That I have to use these identifiers for other people to understand who I am and that we are not able to walk away from those identities yet because of that complexity and that there are 567 tribal nations, not everyone, including myself, has those memorized. So yeah, that's why I think it's like really complicated. And yeah, for the work being political, I mean, I used to say, I'm not trying to be political at the same time, like our existence is political itself. So I think you have to get kind of like, we can't walk away from that. And there's a reason we can't walk away from that. So um, I would, yeah, I think I had to also reflect, you know, during my younger years, I'm like, I mean, I'm just taking portraits. Is that political? And it becomes political because it's our existence and our existence shouldn't be here in these spaces. So immediately, right, no matter what we do, we're political and we end up representing everybody. And that's the part that's also complicated as well, um, even when we don't try to, right? So. I think, yeah, I think I had to sit with that for a long time, especially in my undergraduate year and become okay with like, no matter what I do, my existence, my being, my breathing, my space, anything will always be political. Um, so quick lightning round to end up our panel today. Um, one of the attendees asks, what would you want non-Native people and communities to do and not to do in order to better support Native communities? I would say the same thing to someone who is a part of my community um, is to get informed um, and be your own resource as far as that would allow you to reflect and to engage with those conversations and those biases, that lack of information that you may have um, and always reach out to those who are able to self-identify. We're, you know, we're in 2021. And I would just caution uh, informed consent for those who are outside of the community to coming into the community, uh, similar to the work that Vicki does in terms of uh, consistent consent throughout the project and that representation of it. Um, and as artists, as creatives uh, who are outside of that, um, I would take ownership of, ownership of your creativity and the interpretations that it may have on others, so. I'm sorry, I missed the question. <laughs> uh, uh, we're pushing up against the, the one minute warning. Um, so I think uh, just in, you know, making sure that, that we close up in a good way. Um, I'll leave that that question, um, you know, sort of out in the open for people to think about. Um, I think Raphael gave a really great answer. Education, you know, thinking about consent and, um, you know, having conversations and sort of the bravery, right, to step outside of maybe what you know um, to really make uh, substantive connections, right, with with different communities and with other individuals. Um, so we're right at 12 o'clock and I just want to say a deep, deep thank you to Pam and Raphael and to Vicki. It was completely my privilege to be able to sit in and to hear you guys talk through your process as artists, um, and, um, you know, the, the process that it, that it takes to be a creator, right? Um, and so... Uh, many thanks to you from all of our attendees and from DU as an institution. And I think we have um, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion who will also help wrap up the panel. But thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Angela. And I want to formally thank um, each and every one of you again today. That was truly a fantastic panel um, and that artwork was beautiful. Thank you all for sharing. 
As a final reminder, for those of you who joined us live today, you will receive an email with a link for a session evaluation, and we greatly appreciate your feedback. Please view the online schedule and register for our upcoming Diversity Summit sessions. Thank you again for joining us, and I um, we hope that you will join us for our next panel, which is happening later tonight. It is the Critical Conversations Indigenous and Native American Perspective starting at 4 p.m., um, and I just want to do a shout Shout out to all of the audience members who um, who asked these fantastic questions. Uh, bring them tonight as well for our second um, Indigenous panel, and we cannot wait to see you there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.